Now that we've explored how life evolved, or really the timeline in which life evolved, starting with our bacteria and archaea, and then moving up to the evolution of our eukaryotes, we have to start talking about protists, which are our first eukaryotic cells. So while I talked about how did we get a eukaryotic cell, a eukaryotic organism isn't, I guess, alone, right? That eukaryotic cell is a species, and those first species we saw were protists, and that's what we're going to explore in this lecture. So just to kind of put us in a frame of reference, we are in the domain eukarya. Remember, these are eukaryotic cells. And there are four major domains in kingdom, uh, or sorry, there's four major kingdoms in the domain eukarya. Now, I'm going to briefly introduce each of those kingdoms. We're going to explore these a lot more in this class, but I want to introduce them now to kind of put a context around our definition for protists. So I'll start with fungi. Fungi have cell walls, similar to plants, but their cell walls have chitin in it, very similar to what we saw in our archaeans. And these are also heterotrophs, so they have to consume other things. These guys evolved about 1.5 billion years ago. Remember, our first eukaryotic cells were 2 billion years ago, or you could think of it as year uh, 2.5 billion. So eukaryotic cells 2 billion years ago, fungi about 1.5 billion years ago. So, so younger, uh, newer than our first eukaryotic cells. Then we saw the evolution of plants or kingdom plantae. These organisms are photosynthetic. They are multicellular organisms and they have a vascular system. These guys are even newer, evolving only about 850 million years ago. Finally, the last major kingdom that we have is animalia, or animals. These are organisms that are multicellular, and similar to fungi, they are heterotrophic. And these are the newest in our evolutionary history, only evolving about 550 million years ago. And so this is where protists come in. So again, protists were the first eukaryotic organisms. Endosymbiosis created protists, or the eukaryotic organisms. So this is happening again about 2 billion years ago. And I have all these question marks. And the reason I have all these question marks is because the literal definition of a protist is not an animal, not a fungi, and not a plant. There is no unifying characteristic that ties all of the protists together. Some of them are unicellular, some of them are multicellular. Some of them move, some of them don't move. Some of them can create their own energy, some of them have to eat uh, or consume other things to get energy. There is no unifying characteristic that ties a protist together. So instead, scientists just say, hey, they're not plants, fungi, or animals. They are everything else. Here's an, uh, a phylogenetic tree looking at the ancestral eukaryote, the very first eukaryotic cell, and kind of showing the branches that eukaryotes have taken. Everything in yellow are prokaryotes. Here's fungi over here, animals, and plants. And you can see that some of our protists are more closely related to plants then they are other protists, are more closely related to animals than everything else. So protists are kind of just this hodgepodge of different things. Now in this class, we are gonna explore some of these different um, groups of protists that you see. We're not gonna go, we're not gonna talk about all of them. There's so many of them. And they're constantly being reclassified. Because there's no unifying thing with protists, we. <laughs> Scientists do our best, right? But but these guys are kind of a mystery, and I wouldn't say a mystery, but they're just not a beautiful, nice, organized thing. So what scientists do is instead of using terms like phyla and classes and whatnot, we put protists into groups. Here's this group, here's what unifies this group, but these change all the time. You guys are watching this video now. This is what it's currently like in 2021. If I use this video again in the future, that this could change. Uh, so it, it's constantly in flux. There's current research going on that are trying to organize these protists. Now for this class, what I'm gonna focus on are protists that exist here in the Maryland area and some things that you're likely to find under a microscope if you took some pond water and started to investigate what was in it. Now, in addition to the formal groupings that we're gonna go through here soon, protists also have informal groupings. And by informal, um, there's two different terms that we're gonna use. The first one is protozoa. 
So proto, that prefix, means first, and then zoa refers to animal. So these are the animal-like protists. Well, what makes them animal-like? Well, they're first of all, they're heterotrophic, meaning they consume other things, similar to animals. The reason they're not considered animals, though, is that all protozoans are single cellular. They are only one cell. In order to be classified as an animal, you have to be multicellular. So animal-like characteristics, but not actually animals. We do think that protozoans were what gave rise to animals, though. And we'll talk more about that when we get to our animal unit. And then the other informal grouping is algae. Algae are plant-like protists. These algae are photosynthetic, so they have chloroplasts or similar types of organelles that allow them to do photosynthesis similar to plants. However, the reason they're not considered plants is they lack vascularization. We'll talk in depth about vascularization in plants, but essentially vascularization means having a network uh, within the organism that will transport sugars, transport water, transport nutrients to different parts of the organism. So algae can be multicellular, but even if it's multicellular, it lacks a vascular system, which is why it's not considered a plant. You're going to notice that a lot of the algae groups, their names end in phyta, and phyta refers to plant-like. So you're going to see things like Chlorophyta, okay, that's something plant-like. Or um, I'm trying to think of the ones we do in this class. There's rhodophyta, there's ochrophyta. Um, we don't use all of those terms in this class, but when you see phyta, think plants. Now there's going to be separate videos on protozoans. There's going to be another video on algae, but I am going to go ahead and introduce one of the groups of protists because they're kind of unique in that they're considered both a protozoan and an algae. And this is group dinoflagellates. So before we look at these pictures or talk about anything, group dinoflagellates. So di refers to two, and then flagellates is referring to flagella. So group dinoflagellates are unique in that they have two flagella. And the way the flagella are positioned, I think is really cool. So I'm going to share it with you. So this first really large image, this is taken from a scanning electron microscope, so which is why we have so much detail. And around the middle of this dinoflagellate, there's a little groove. And inside of that groove is a flagella. And you might notice that this flagella is kind of a corkscrew shape. There is a second flagella that's elsewhere. You can see it right here. The second flagella, not really as corkscrew shaped. The way dinoflagellates move, is that corkscrew flagella spins and spins and spins and causes the dinoflagellate to spin and spin and spin. The second flagella is almost used as a rudder to kind of move that spinning motion into a direction. These other two pictures, this is why, what you might see under a light microscope in a typical lab classroom. And while you can't see the flagella, flagella don't preserve really awesome um, when preparing specimens but you can still see that groove, right? We see the groove in the middle of this dinoflagellate, in the middle of this dinoflagellate. So although we don't see the flagella, that groove is pretty unique. Um, so definitely write that down. And I actually would encourage you to do super rough sketches of these dinoflagellates as well. Well, I'm not going to share with you the species name because it doesn't really matter. All dinoflagellates, all species that are within this group, do share the two flagella and do share that groove where one of the flagella sit. I mentioned before that this group is considered both an algae and a protozoan. And the reason for that is because they're considered mixotrophs. So we've got autotrophs, we've got heterotrophs, and we have this mixotroph. Depending on the conditions, they can photosynthesize, so they do have um, the photosynthesizing organelles, but if conditions aren't good, um, it's really cloudy or it's nighttime, they actually do consume other things. They can eat other things in order to get energy. So they can actually do both, which is why I talk about them here. Now, the last thing I want to present to you um, and I'm going to have you watch it just at the end of this video. There'll be a video that'll pop up in a little bit that shows you some two interesting phenomena that some dinoflagellates do related to our, maybe not everyday life, 
but phenomena that you may have heard of before, especially if you go to the beach often. Some dinoflagellates have bioluminescence or bioluminate, and some dinoflagellates, when there's a whole bunch of them in one area, can actually create something that's incredibly poisonous uh, called, um, called a red tide. If you guys live in the um, Rockville area, there's some dinoflagellates, although they don't create a red tide, they are incredibly toxic to uh, humans and to your pets. And some of the local lakes in Montgomery County do actually um, get a whole bunch of dinoflagellates that are very poisonous, and there'll be signs around saying, hey, like, don't go in the water. Some of those poisonous dinoflagellates are literally red in color, hence the name red tide. So the next slide is going to be a summary, and then I'm going to refer back to that video for you guys to go watch. So again, our protists just aren't fungi, aren't animals, and aren't plants. They're, they're kind of everything in between. We don't really have official phyla or class names just because they're constantly being regrouped, so we just put them in groups. There is some informal groupings, so we can refer to algae as being the more plant-like protists and protozoans as the more animal-like protists. Those are not formal groups, though. The first formal group we talked about were, was group dinoflagelletta, or the group dinoflagellates. And what you can do now is go ahead and, as this video ends, end this video and I'll open up the video that's going to pop up here to learn more about dinoflagellates. So again, this is the end of this video. Go ahead and click the link that is going to be popping up above me to learn more about the bioluminescence and red tides that some species of dinoflagellates do. Be sure to record that in your notes as well.